Welcome to M Squared TechCast. Hey, it's Matt Roush. And Mike Brennan. And Mike, let's officially greet each other oh, here. Yes, yeah, yes, okay. There you go. Elbow All, right. Bump. All right. We normally hug, but no hugging today. No so, hugging today. Uh, Sorry. But anyway, so <laughs> my drive in from Ann Arbor, uh, it's had an impact. I mean, I've never seen traffic that light. That light, in yeah. Detroit in the middle of the day. Yeah, when I when I drove to work on Friday morning, I noticed it for the first time. It was like a weekend day. Yeah, oh, it's really gosh. something. Well, and, you know, and then our master boardologist there, David Phillips, and I were talking beforehand. It's like we don't know whether we should. Is it too much panic? Not enough panic, but we've got an expert here. We have a coronavirus expert, yes. Fred Brown who has been on the show before, and uh, he one of the many things that he did in the past was he helped develop the HIV uh, vaccine and other things. And he, if you go to my website, mitechnews.com, he has his column there posted in the featured section where he talks about all the things that we should be doing to get this under control. Right, Fred? That's right. Okay, let's talk about a few of those things. You got a, It's a very long column. You have a lot of points in there. Let's talk about the ones that I kind of highlight, which I think are going to start happening pretty soon. For instance, establishing the rapid drive-through testing centers like they have. Yeah, uh, let's let's hear Italy, about Italy and places like that. Yeah, let's hear about what we should be doing. Go ahead. Yeah, Fred. the testing is, is the first big thing, and we need to establish them in drive-through centers. You don't want to have to go to your doctor when you think you have. Uh, or, or pharmacy when you think you have the, the, the bug, otherwise you're going to infect other people. Right. So you want to be able to drive right through the center, drop off a sample swab in your nose and mouth, and continue driving. Uh, and then that uh, sample is tested. Uh, the turnaround time is about three and a half hours now uh, for rapid testing. Uh, the, you, the, the FDA just approved that test, and within 24 hours you should know whether you have the disease and you should stay isolated in, until you know, you've got your, your results back. And if you have positive results, you should wait until both your nasal cavities and your throat uh, is cleared of, of, of the of infection. So you'd have to have another test to be cleared. You'd have to have another test to be cleared then. Two more tests, yes. Yeah, one okay. in your nose and one in your in your throat. Okay. So that would be the other question is there's so much well, people don't know. They don't understand what they should be doing. So if they do test positive, they go home and, and then uh, quarantine themselves for 14 days, go to the hospital, go to the doctor. What should they do? Yeah, they, uh, they should stay home uh, if they're asymptomatic. Most people, about 80%, will be asymptomatic or will only have a, a slight bug. So you shouldn't go walking wounded into the hospital and, 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 and plug up services that people who really are having bad responses to the virus are having. Hmm. About 20% of those people will have, you know, severe enough response to have to go to the doctor. And of those 10%, you know, of those about, you know, depending on your age, uh, will have a severe response. Hmm. Okay. Why don't you take the next one, man? All right. And uh, what role can telehealth services play in this response? Yeah, telehealth is really critical. To the extent possible, if you've got, uh, we, you know, we should be kind of tripling the uh, number of telehealth services that we're uh, offering in the country today. There are a number of telehealth services, and that is, is all fully reimbursed. And the idea here is, you stay home, uh, you contact a medical professional remotely. They can check for symptoms, decide whether or not further treatment needs to be uh, happening, and help you through the help you treat the disease through the through its uh, through its natural. Uh, for progression. So, uh, to the extent possible, you know, uh, if you can stay home and be treated at home, that's ideal. And telehealth, telemedicine really helps us do that. Okay. Which isn't part of your list here, but part of that would be if people are at home, a lot of people live by themselves and maybe have a few friends around or family. How do you sell quarantine for 14 days when you got to make money, you got to eat, you got to do things like that? I mean, how do we solve that problem? Yeah, that's a big problem, and you know, to the extent that you can uh, add value in your work uh, remotely, you should. If you have access already to, you know, smartphones, hotspots, and computers, you make use of them. If you don't, see if your employer uh, can provide them uh, for you during this period, uh, to the to the to, to the extent possible. Um, if you, you know, the, that that's a huge challenge for us. About seventy percent of our workers. Uh, you know, are part-time or have hourly positions, and so they're not 
uh, fully covered. Now, the U.S. government is trying to provide that coverage uh, and, and for people to be able to take sick leave uh, to, to, to self-quarantine, and um, that, that, that relief hopefully will be coming out shortly. But uh, it, to the extent possible, you know, work at home. Right now, we have four adults in my house, and we're all working from home, uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's working reasonably well. And, uh, you know, if, if you're interested, I can send you some uh, links to Harvard Business School, for example, that explains how to make home work uh, much more productive. There, there's some tricks to the trade there, and I'll, I'll send it over to you, Mike. Yeah, yeah that'd I'd, be great. I'd, I'd like to see that myself because I have a feeling uh, we've already got several people in my office who have immune-compromised people in their household, so they're working from home, and they've set us all up with a VPN so we can work from home if we need to. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how uh, we should be managing containment zones. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, the first thing is that uh, they, they need to be pretty clear. Uh, for example, Gretchen Whitmore has told us, you know, no gym, no theaters, uh, and and uh, 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 and uh, no bars and restaurants uh, uh, starting at 3 o'clock this afternoon. That That's a nice, clear message uh, to the extent that we can make it even more clear about, uh, about how far away people should be standing even in zones that are not contained yet. It's, it's important to maintain a five-foot distance uh, uh, from from everyone. Gonna move apart uh, here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you're, how, how you're, uh, how you're, well, it's uh, only a six foot uh, desk, so. Yeah. Right now, my guess is you're closer than five feet away from each other. Yeah, yes. more, more, more like three. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I just won't breathe on them or anything. So. Okay, yeah. I won't sneeze, I promise. Yeah. Uh, then uh, also, and, and oh, go ahead. Choose your, choose your, choose your venues, too. You know, there's, yeah. there's certain areas where, where, um, where the, the, the venues are going to be clearly a, 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 prop, a, a, a problem. You know, uh, uh, for example, health health centers, hospitals, uh, mm-hmm. theaters, gyms, uh, prisons, um, the, the, you know, uh, theaters. Uh, those kinds of areas are, are where you have concentrated masses of people, or you're waiting in line for periods of time uh, close enough to people for them to touch you or to uh, unfortunately cough on you yeah. or breathe on you, that, that's where the uh, dangers really increase. One of the scariest pictures I saw on Facebook over the weekend was Chicago O'Hare Airport where everyone was pouring in from Europe, all like in a cattle area, all standing next to each other for hours trying to get through clearance. So, And then they were going to get in their own individual airplanes and fly off to wherever. Holy cow, right? Yeah, that that. That that's an example of a poorly contained containment zone. That's why I recommended having the National Guard come out and being able to, you know, yeah. manage that, that. And that's because we just didn't have the capacity in our security system to manage that flow of people. People should basically be, uh, <laughs> you know, be kept separate uh, to the extent possible while waiting in those lines. And a, you know, a, a good National Guard level response would be, would have been able to contain that and prevent that level of crowding but that 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 is, was a real problem an example of a real big problem and that sort of that sort of leads into the next issue which is the the need to expand first responder staffing let's talk about that a little bit absolutely yeah you know in, in the past when i was i was responsible for coordinating the tamiflu uh, uh distribution in europe at the h5n1 um and tamiflu stopped the progression of the disease and 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 closed off how much time people would be sick and how much how how sick they would get we don't have anything like that this is a novel virus and so we do, we're just mm-hmm. starting you know our immune systems aren't ready for it we don't have no and we have no drugs or vaccines for it and so you can expect that probably 70 to 80 percent of first responders are likely to get this disease unfortunately and so mm-hmm. um you know, right now uh we're kind of working at pretty high capacity of our first responders. You can imagine a sudden surge in certain areas. Certain areas, you know, won't have a, a big outbreak, but there will be areas in the country that are likely to have a pretty a large surge. And unfortunately, it's hard to move, uh, you know, uh, from hospital to hospital region. The National Guard is different in the sense that it could, you, you could actually deploy a large number of new, fresh people into an area who are well trained to deal with 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 a response like this, and that's what we really need. Unfortunately, you know, if you're working in Toledo and the, the big outbreak in, in in Grand in Grand Rapids, you're not going to be able to move your emergency medical teams uh, from Toledo to Grand Rapids because you're expecting Toledo to have some problems. Whereas a National Guard unit could go out uh, to, to Grand Rapids where the outbreak was occurring and really help out in that space. And that's what we need to get to. And, and we all know Mo- Mobile Army Surgical Hospital from Mesh, right? I mean, that's that's, right. that's what the Army does really well, right? Yeah. 
So, so the scariest thing, the scariest thing to me about this is though uh, the the shortage of ICU beds and ventilators. Uh, is there anything we could do about that at this late date, or do we just have to try to flatten the proverbial curve? Well, there are some ways of making uh, beds more, you know, more, uh, ready for more intense, uh, more intensive. Uh, the problem is that it's twofold. First, we don't have quite enough uh, ICU beds, even if you take an average sort of response that's that's that's, uh, that's, that's expected that we're we're about forty five thousand short. If we actually have you know a peak in certain areas, we're probably a hundred thousand beds short, oh. and each bed, uh, you know, unfortunately requires uh, a, about one and a half extra staff people uh, on average to to man to be successful, and unfortunately, probably you know. 60%, 70% of the ICU support teams will also get infected. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, you can start to see, you know, not only is it a shortness of beds, but it's actually going to be a shortness of, of equipment. On the oxygen side, Italy was running out of oxygen, and that really causes a lot of death. So we have to move. Uh, there, there are special ways of, of ranking people in the ICU, and maybe we can discharge people who, you know, don't, 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 don't need the ICU anymore. Uh, but right now, we're running at high capacity without the Without this this outbreak, and if it increases, um, you know, it's going to get uh, challenging to to serve all the people. Well, we've only got about um, go ahead, Fred. We only got about a minute left, so we're not going to be able to sure. get through all your points. But one of the things I wanted to ask, I know you've got a huge LinkedIn following. Are you providing any consulting services right now? Uh, are you encouraging people to contact you or reach out to you, or what are you doing in that space? Yeah, I'm working with a couple of hospitals, and I'm also working with Johns Hopkins University uh, uh, and their continuing medical education to uh, run. Uh, we have a, a, a for medical professionals as well as anyone who's interested. We have a full uh, education program on how to manage uh, coronavirus outbreaks that we're just publishing now. Costs a hundred dollars, and it's available to anyone who wants it uh, for, for a full year which is uh, the expectation for when this virus eventually will start to move through the system, become a normal thing to manage, uh, with all the updates uh, for anyone who's interested. So if you're interested in that, I can certainly send you a link to, to those to those offerings. Okay, why don't you do that? I'll post it to my website. Folks can go there and then go ahead and, and, and get that report. Wonderful. Wonderful. I appreciate the time. You all right. Thanks. There. Yeah, thanks for being with us today. Fred Brown, President and Chief Operating Officer of Fred Brown Management Consulting, LLC. Check him out. He is an infectious disease expert. Additional four-year students love Lawrence Technological University's thriving campus life. But LTU has always met non-traditional students' needs, too. Lawrence Tech offers over 100 degree and certificate programs that can get adult students started or back on track. And most of our classes are conveniently offered evenings at our beautiful Southfield campus or online so you can balance your social, family, and work life even while you power up your career. Lawrence Tech, where blue devils dare.